which takes us to what's the synapse. And so the synapse is the junction point between neurons and whatever tissue it's interacting with. It's the communication point. It is a specialized gap junction. The function of the, of the synapse is to act as a relay checkpoint. It establishes a delay in the transmission of the signal so that we ensure the appropriate pathway is being activated. It's going to allow for either amplification of the signal, a greater output, or a muting of the signal, a reduction of output along the pathway. The synapse itself is held in place by a series of proteins known as connexons that hold the membranes in proximity to each other and can function as a pore between two neurons in the formation of the strong and or electrical synaptic function. The synapse itself is going to be involved with exocytotic release of neurotransmitters from cell A to receptors on cell B so as to allow for a ligand gated response on cell B relative to the actions on cell A. There are different types of synapses based off of use or disuse. So the different types of clefts and synapses, and so clefts is that space in between the synaptic membranes. Primarily, we're talking about chemical synapses. To a lesser extent, we're talking about electrical synapses. Chemical synapses are going to involve the release of neurotransmitters, whereas electrical synapses are going to allow for conveyance of electrical signals via movement of ions directly from cell A to cell B. If the synapse is used more often, we get a larger synaptic membrane. This larger synaptic membrane forces the membranes closer in proximity to each other. We also get a greater density of neurotransmitters in cell A based off of the use of that synapse, making the synapse, quote unquote, stronger. The more strong that synapse becomes, the more electrical the synapse will function as, allowing for the connexons to act as ionic gates in between the two membranes. As I use the synapse less, the cleft distance expands. The rate at which the two cells interact with each other diminishes. This diminished use leads to atrophication of that synapse. If we have excessive synaptic atrophication, because the cell is no longer secreting, we can actually have apoptosis or neuronal death. This atrophication pathway is what causes the neurodegenerative diseases because of the neurons getting a constant signal of no connection. So let's take a look at how these synapses look in terms of their overall structure. So here is the traditional ligand or chemical synapse in which we have a synaptic cleft, which is a extracellular gelatinous matrix where we have release of synaptic chemicals, neurotransmitters being released from the presynaptic membrane, which will interact with ligand-gated sodium channels or chloride channels on the postsynaptic membrane which will either increase or decrease ionic flow into the postsynaptic membrane, allow, allowing for either propagation or inhibition of the action potential being passed. As we start using these synapses more often, we get greater connexon development and alignment of the connexons 
in between the synapses. As these synapses get used more often, what ends up happening is that we can go from this chemical transmission to an ion transmission. So what ends up happening is that the ions will flow from the presynaptic membrane into the postsynaptic membrane, causing the direct transference of the action potential from cell A to cell B. The last bit of adaptation that can take place is what's referred to as neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. Neurogenesis is taking place all the time within our cerebral cortex in an attempt to replace neurons that are being lost due to normal aging processes. However, under the right stimulus, epididymal cells surrounding the ventricles, particularly the lateral ventricles, can convert from being epididymal glial cells into being full functioning neurons. These full functioning neurons will then radially grow. And as they radially grow, they will form synaptic connections. And if those synaptic connections remain intact, that neuron will become full functional. We can prevent some of this neurogenesis based off of reduction of growth factors, increase of inflammatory signaling, and formation of scar tissues within the axons and surrounding the synaptic connection points. There is a large amount of evidence of this taking place within two distinct regions of adult brains in particular within the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus and within the subventricular space of the limbic system. There have been multiple studies of individuals that have shown that we actually get greater hippocampal mass during periods of heavy learning that not only have a large increase in neural connections, but also allow for greater amounts of total neurons within those areas. The way in which this functions is that based off of signals, in particular, noggin, BDNF, VEGF, the epididymal cells lining the ventricles will undergo an activation signal. They will undergo a rapid replication followed by a neuroblastulation. This neuroblastulation will then grow along existing axons in what's referred to as a radial growth pattern. This radial growth pattern will allow for the formation of the soma within the correct cortical strata, which will then allow for branching and formation of the synapse. As long as the synapse is being formed, that maturing neuron will remain. If the synapses are not formed, even though it started to undergo its neurulating processes, it will immediately become apoptotic and be lost. Because of the amount of signals that need to take place in order to get this full new neuron, neurons undergo a secondary pathway known as neuroplasticity. This neuroplasticity allows for a greater efficiency within the system so that we are not over-reliant upon additional neurons to allow for a greater functionality. The primary plasticity that we see, particularly within learning, is what's referred to as the Habian synaptic plasticity. And this is where we get synchronicity. <laughs> 
between converging neurons within a diverging pathway. And so one of the plasticities that we see is this Habian synchronicity. What ends up happening is that the neurons that are synchronizing, they're firing onto a convergent node will start to fire in such a way that they will cause an action potential to come away at the same time. So what ends up happening is that we lose what's referred to as the jitter. And the jitter is the period of time in between when an action potential was sent and when the next action potential can be sent. And so during the learning process, during the synchronization process, what ends up happening is that the neurons are attempting to coordinate their signals through collateral inhibition signals and collateral excitation signals so that we get presynaptic and postsynaptic summation patterns on the convergent neuron so that upon the terminus of the synchronicity of signaling, the resultant jitter is the same as the initial jitter. The rate of action potentials and the, logarith and the logarithmic compression of that train of action potentials will be different, but the jitter will be the same, which means that we now have a much more efficient pathway coming out from this synchronicity. The synchronicity occurs as you take previously learned knowledge and apply it to new learned knowledge. This is the same type of pathway that takes place when you learn motor behaviors and why it takes time for you to learn an initial motor behavior. But once you've learned the initial motor behavior, it becomes quote unquote, second nature. This same pathway of synchronicity leads to what is usually referred to as quote unquote muscle memory. The other thing that takes place during this is sprouting amongst synchronous dendrites and synchronous axonal terminals. What was up happening is that we actually gain connection points when we have synchronous firing, we actually get a more robust output on the synchronous firing than we get with the asynchronous firing. When we have a robust amount of synchronous firing, what ends up happening is that that pathway becomes much stronger and much less likely to be lost due to disease, damage, or disuse. If we go from normal to a synchronous robust, if we happen to have atrophication, it's going to head back towards the normal. However, if we start having asynchronous firing, what ends up happening is that that asynchronous neuron will be more apt to being lost due to disuse because it is less robust than the synchronist unit.